next speaker is Paul Heinzman from Leisure Studies at the University of Ottawa. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to this session. Uh, my presentation is Worship, Leisure, and Well-Being. And I'd like to begin by thanking the Calvin Institute of Worship, which funded this research project, and also to uh, a research assistant, Hannah Jansen, who uh, assisted me with it. So when I put this abstract together and submitted it, I submitted it in the topical area of health and life sciences. I think the, the title for this session actually includes uh, psychology, behavior, and neuroscience. Well, mine has nothing to do with neuroscience, probably most related to behavior, maybe a little bit to psychology. And so what I'm presenting arises from a larger study on leisure and worship, and that is the study funded by the Calvin Institute of Worship. It had a theological component, a theological essay, a qualitative component, and a quantitative. I've done the two first phases, uh, but not the third phase, not the quantitative phase. And this specific presentation focuses on the qualitative study. And I went back and looked, with, it focused on leisure and worship, and I went back and looked at were there any connections with well-being, because that was the within the topical area uh, that the conference was looking for papers. But what I'll do, an overview, I'm still going to talk a little bit about the theological understandings, um, then I'll move into the, the overall findings of the qualitative study, and then the more recent analysis related to uh, well-being, which really should be perceived well-being. So and before that, I'll define my terms. Uh, leisure, I'm a leisure studies scholar. Uh, there's different ways to define leisure. One is the classical view, which goes back to Aristotle, Augustine, and so on, which is a contemplative attitude, a way of life. Then there's an idea that leisure is activity, something that you voluntarily choose to do. That's a behavior, an activity. Then there's leisure as time. That's the time in your life when you're not working or you're not doing existence activities such as sleep and eating. <clears throat> leisure is a symbol of social class. Thorsten Bedlin said that it was characterized by conspicuous consumption and conspicuous leisure. People are displaying their behaviors for others to see. Feminist leisure tends to focus on meaningful experiences and enjoyment. Psychological experience is a, is a state of mind. It, it, it's your mental experience, often characterized by things such as flow or peak experience. And holistic view is that all of life is a whole and you can't break it down into work and existence. Everything just sort of fits together into a holistic way of life. So I cover all this in a whole terms course. I've given you a very brief introduction. And sort of my view combines, my own view combines the classical state of being, which is generally the Roman Catholic view, and the activity view, which tends to be the Protestant view, but also scripture supports both, and see them coming together and that we have a spiritual attitude of leisure that characterizes all of our life, but within that, we have certain times and periods where we engage in activities. There's a rhythm of work and life. Um, I have diagrammed that, and this is something, well, in the previous slide there, this is a book of mine that came out in 2015, Leisure and Spirituality, which basically talks about a Christian perspective on these. And so after I did the book, I, I was given a presentation in the United States, and uh, I put together this diagram that worship undergirds qualitative leisure, which is the attitude that we have, and from that attitude flows both our work and our recreation or intensified leisure. Worship, maybe you might be a little bit more familiar with that. The word comes from worth-ship. So it's a quality related to worth. What is it that we attribute worth to? So when we worship, we are saying that God has worth, that God is worthy. In the Bible, there's two main uh, uses of the word of worship, to bow down, to kneel, to put one's faith down, Face down is an act of respect and submission, and the other has to do with more with serving and doing. Um, 
True worship of God is when we love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's when we praise God above everything else and put him first in our hearts. So theologically, uh, theologians, biblical scholars have seen the connection between leisure and worship in different ways. So one way, I'm going to go over four different ways. One is leisure as worship, and an argument could be made from Scripture for that. And uh, many people who try to articulate a Christian understanding of leisure talk about the Sabbath. That's the most common biblical concept that is used. And I'm not going to go into all this detail. There's just sort of background. The Sabbath tends to be characterized by no work, but also by worship. So there you see when people are, if, if you're connecting Sabbath to leisure, Sabbath is connected with worship. So there's one possible connection. And uh, the, the scholar Leonard Duhon said, Sabbath living included joyous festivity. It was a sign of the covenant, a moment of intensified worship. Fewer Christian scholars would connect uh, leisure with the biblical concept of rest. And Von Rad, Garrett Von Rad, published a paper in 1966. And he talked about five different strands of the concept of rest. In the Bible, it begins with a very physical rest in Deuteronomy and moves much more towards a more uh, spiritual as you go through. But again, if you're saying as some leisure scholars do, that there's a connection between the biblical concept of rest and leisure, then you see the biblical concept of rest is also connected with worship. And so then uh, here's another way to connect worship with leisure. So in, and throughout history, Augustine talked about the contemplative life. Uh, Aquinas located leisure in the beatific vision of God. Uh, Luther talked about we worship God most when we rest, Packer talked about leisure as uh, semi-leisure of a weekly day of worship. Uh, this young was a scholar who did a study in, in Yellowstone, and uh, he said worship is a very real sense would be classified as leisure. And again, Duhan, leisure is a time, a joyful time, a covenant time when we celebrate our gifts, past, present, and future. So that's one way of seeing the connection between the two. A second is that leisure and worship share similar qualities. And one author has talked about this is Graham Neville. There's an affinity between worship and leisure. He says there's have certain features in common, such as recreation. But he also says there are certain parts of worship that have no obvious connection to leisure, such as confession and ceremonial care of the dead. So he, he he says they're not the same as in number one, but they have similar qualities. And Leland Riken has a similar view. There's a kinship between worship and leisure. They both have a halt in time. Things such as worship services have qualities same as leisure. A third way, third way of looking at it is that leisure facilitates worship. So that uh, our leisure creates a certain uh, space for us or a certain attitude that helps us worship. And we could see in Psalm 46, uh, be still and know that I am God. Actually, in Septuagint, it says, have leisure and know that I am God. And this is the basis for Pieper's book, Leisure, the Basis of Culture, uh, where he argues for a classical view, he's a Roman Catholic theologian, a classical view of leisure, which is a letting go, which is consistent with uh, Psalm 46.10. And then a fourth way is worship facilitating leisure. And uh, the, the classic statement right here is Peepers, leisure can only be made possible and justifiable on the same basis as the celebration of the divine. Divine worship then is the deepest of the springs of which leisure is fed and continues to be vital. And there's a number of other scholars that make the same point. So, but there's very little empirical literature on the relationship between leisure and worship. Uh, there's a study on uh, women, uh, two different studies, and the study on youth, uh, and this one is the one that's most connected, 
and looked at youth as youth recreation worship. And the authors of this study, Sonnenberg and Bernard, concluded that yes, youth recreation is worship based on the four themes they came up with. What about empirical research on worship and well-being? And there's a number of studies that connect worship to different types of well-being. Of course, there's subjective well-being, there's physical well-being, mental well-being, and so on. But so there's different uh, worship, well-being, worship and spiritual well-being, worship services and mental well-being. So these two studies focus on attending worship services and their connection with either mental well-being or spiritual well-being. And then there's literature, uh, research studies that connect leisure to the various aspects of well-being. I tend to focus on this relationship. This whole book is based on leisure and health and wellness that covers all this. But so there's bodies of literature on these two, but not necessarily the connection between worship, leisure, and well-being. So here's the qualitative study that I did. There are 12 participants, range of ages, all over North America, different ethnicities, and a variety of denominational affiliations. How did these people understand worship? So I asked them, how do you define worship? How do you understand worship? So the primary understanding was that worship was associated with a way of life. For example, I would describe worship as a lifestyle. Worship for me is a lifestyle. So it was something that permeated the participants' lives. That was the primary way that they defined what worship is. They also uh, talked about corporate worship. So worship such as we're doing here at the conference this morning, tomorrow morning, gather, coming together and people uh, worshiping God by scripture, reading, singing songs, uh, hearing the scripture read, asking for forgiveness, sacraments, and so on. And then a third understanding was individual worship. People talked about this in different ways, but as a personal time, off on a daily basis, uh, quiet time, devotions, but there was a time when a person did it individually. How did the participants understand leisure? There's three themes here. One, that it was associated with a sense of freedom. And so the key words here that you can see that I have bold, people had the opportunity to choose what they're doing. So that's very much related to the activity view of leisure or free time. But in both cases, a sense of freedom. Freedom in terms of they're not obligated to do certain things and freedom in terms of the activities or behaviors they're deciding to engage in. A second theme, when I asked them to understand what their understanding of leisure was, had to do with rest, refreshment, and relaxation. So leisure tended to give the participants refreshment, renewal, recreation. One person actually talked about in terms of biblical terms, Sabbath rest, self-care. And then the third theme in terms of understanding leisure was associated with a state of being, enjoying creation, appreciating beauty. It's an attitude. It's a peace of mind. It involves joy, wonder, sense of harmony. It's being open to God communion. So this is very much related to the classical understanding of leisure, the first of the seven definitions I had given you, and very much uh, connected with uh, the book, Joseph Pieper's book, Leisure the Basis of Culture. So then I asked them, well, how do they see the relationship between worship and leisure? And so one theme here was that worship permeates all of life. So if uh, worship is permeating all of life, then it has to permeate uh, leisure, uh, leisure as well. Uh, every aspect of life is associated with worship. That means leisure too. Uh, within our leisure, it's really important for it to also bring worship to God. Uh, 
like leisure, like worship can, even resting, like leisure can be a form of worship. So worship permeated all life, including leisure. Secondly, worship was connected through being. Leisure had something about to do about just being. And that was associated, or they understood that to be connected to worship as well. Leisure is required for worship, to be in that space of mind, to be in the presence of God. Thirdly, the participants tended to talk about creation, that the connection between leisure and worship was particularly evident when in creation. Worship can just help me be, just be in connection with God, being out in beautiful nature, walking with my friend. I was just telling God, thank you for the beautiful world you made. In creation, of course, so there's a sense of a deepening of relationship with God, and that's the purpose of worship. There were also, this was not quite as strong a theme, but worship and leisure had connections to free time and activity. In my free time, that's when I see I'm having that worship and leisure merge. When there was that free time, it provided the opportunity for a person to simultaneously experience leisure and worship. And specific leisure activities that participate associated with worship varied from one person to the other. It wasn't certain activities, leisure activities that were associated with leisure and worship, but it varied. It was different for each person. Okay, so then to come to what themes were there related to worship, leisure, and well-being. So this is the uh, subsequent analysis I did to try and see was there anything related to uh, perceived well-being, perceived health, when they talked about this connection between worship and leisure. Well, a number of the people talked about the connection with physical health and the body. Uh, God should have our attention all the time, and certainly worship when it's not part of leisure should inform how we live our leisure life. I, am I doing something good for my body? So that person was concerned that when they're worship and having leisure, that it's important to be doing something good for the body. Whether it's just exercise or actually playing a sport, when I'm able to be in worshipable space with anything I'm doing with my body, I think it be, can be worship. So emphasizing that something with the body can be worship, can be leisure. Uh, leisure activities that really enhance my worship by making my body more fit, which in the end is God wants us to be healthy bodies. Of course, when people are talking in an interview, they don't always have the best grammar and punctuation, so just trying to highlight the ideas here. A very related idea was a sense of uh, a stress relief. And this, this person up here, participant D, talked about dancing as a form of exercising. It was a form of worshiping for her. And through that, she had a sense of release, a sense of relief. And that also was associated with an opening up of her communication with God. Uh, the second person, participant F, Leisure is where I could recover. This person was talking about a time when had recently graduated, was a student, was burnt out. Leisure provided an opportunity to recover. He used the term intentional rest, which he also talked about as being worshipful rest. And he saw that as being more healthy as opposed to a mindless, selfish rest that didn't stem or didn't arise from worship. Third, and this goes back to the previous theme and the other question, is a connection to creation. Uh, so this person here, participant C, talked about going to a waterfall. She talked a lot about being in nature. When she was in nature, she was worshiping. That's when she had her leisure. She went for hiking a lot. And she said, I'm in a good, and, a good state of well-being, a form of worship for me. And then participant age, going hiking along a non strenuous hike is very leisure for me. It's also very worshipful because I talk to God a lot. It's very recreation. It's good for my body. It's fun. It's play. Then fourthly, and I, uh, spiritual well-being, um, I didn't give you a definition of spiritual well-being. Uh, and 
these quotes don't necessarily use the term spiritual well-being, but you can see that in these uh, quotations they're talking about uh, worship, leisure, and they're having greater, persons having greater harmony. So quite often spiritual well-being is connected with connections with God, connections to other people. Uh, I do a lot of connecting with God through my hiking and my running. I feel like I really in tune with God. Uh, and then third person, worship to me has become an act of walking. In those moments, worship to me is that act of being in communion with God that I would say be a characteristic of spiritual well-being. And as a result of worship, we are able to enjoy leisure, and that leisure could be good for us. It's a place of our kind of proper orientation to God. So uh, just in conclusion, uh, in terms of limitations, this study was not designed to look at spiritual health uh, or health or well-being. I didn't ask questions about that. I just went back and reanalyzed it. And also, of course, it's a, a small sample. Uh, and last slide, some of the findings relate to previous research that's been done on leisure and spiritual well-being. Worship is an attitude, and quite often it's been found that if people have a grateful attitude, they celebrate, they're receptive, then that's conducive to spiritual well-being. Uh, Often, being in creation is associated with spiritual well-being. And also, the point that it varies from person to person in terms of the recreation or leisure act activity. Not everyone's the same, and so the activities that may be associated with leisure, worship, or sorry, work with worship, and uh, spiritual well-being or well-being are not the same for everyone. Questions? Comments? Um, I'm curious how how this connection and, and this maybe because this wasn't the main focus of your study, but kind of how the connections of worship to leisure, um, how that kind of interacts with folks for whom uh, their work or vocation may be seen as worship. Whether that is folks who are you know professional pastors who are you know leading worship, but also in the ways that folks understand their, you know, may understand their day-to-day -day vocation as an act of worship or, or um, a living out of uh, a call on their life. So I'm just curious if, if how that kind of... Uh, well, I, I would just go back to this diagram and that I would say that Worship undergirds all of our life as Christians, and that is closely associated with this attitude of leisure, which then uh, is uh, informs or energizes both our work and our recreation, our leisure activities. So, you know, work, biblical view of work, I would see as uh, this comes from John Stott that work has to do with uh, help. Uh, providing for the needs of other people or providing for the needs of uh, taking care of stewarding the creation and also has to do a bit with uh, human fulfillment. Uh, so so you're, you're talking about pastors, so their, your, their work could be leading worship. That's a form of work, but hopefully those people in their lives also have some other times during the week when they have their leisure, their recreation. Um, and I mean, in a sense, remember, uh, most of the participants, and I think this is a very biblical view, said that, that, uh, worship, they didn't primarily see it as their corporate worship. Uh, it was, it was something that permeated all their life. And so, uh, our worship should be permeating our work, no matter what, it, whether we're a professor or whether we're a pastor or whatever. I don't know if I've answered your question, but... Yeah, well, I, was, I mean, and, and part of it may just have to do with the fact that this is the focus of your study, so you didn't really ask, but I, I was struck by the fact that none of the, the quotations and examples specifically mention people's work. 
Um, you know, and that may be because also of our view of leisure and work as mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. opposing each other. Yeah. And since you're asking questions about leisure there, separate. That. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that comes back to how how you define work, how you define leisure, and how you see the interrelationship between the two. And I would also say I didn't, I mean, my, po- my study focused on leisure. There's hundreds of books, Christian books, on how we understand a biblical view of work. Right. There's almost none on a biblical view of leisure or recreation. Yes? Yeah, that was sort of my nature of my question was, you know, there's this sort of the weekend warrior, yeah. play hard, work hard, kind of this extreme sports kind of approach to the leisure. Can you say something about sort of disordered approaches to leisure and perhaps what 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 it means in order to constitute worship? Or can we if we find it really fun having an intense weekend, uh, you know, does that still constitute worship, or does there need to be a a restful kind of reflective component to our leisure in order for it to be legitimate? Uh, well, I, I just just thought your question. Here's a slide that I didn't show. But Gordon Dahl's book in 1972, Work, Play, and Worship in Leisure and Society, said the key to a Christian understand. Oh, I didn't. Oh, yeah. Uh, key to a Christian understanding of, of play lies in worship, yet most people tend to worship their work, to work at their play, and to play at their worship. So I think some of those, I mean, you can't generalize everyone, but some of those people that you're talking about uh, go out, they may work at their play. And uh, for some people, play becomes, or their leisure, the recreation beca- activities become their god. They're worshiping those. So, uh, you know, I think he's right, and then that's basically what Piper says as well, that the foundation has to be our worship. And if we're not, you know, we're not worshiping God, things may get out of place and then begin to worship our play. But, I mean, there are also people that are very involved in adventure or really committed that they but they do bring a christian true christian perspective to that and they you know that uh, there's a thing called serious leisure i've been a competitive runner for 52 years the temptation is always that that becomes my god you know or i i you know like (laughs) we become too focused on that yes okay your your last example there might be speaking to us uh, as, I, as I heard worship being talked about, what, what, what struck me was that the notion of worship seems to be something like spirituality, connection to God, expression to God, that sense it's a, there's an attitude on all sides of it. But there's another dimension of worship, which is the formative dimension. And that, that involves things like um, you know, discipline, practices, maybe even things that, that aren't freedom, but that actually puts you under, like you're running, maybe, maybe that's a kind of pathway. I guess my question was, does this study kind of attend more to the first notion of worship, or does it attend to the formative side, too, where there's a, a, a kind of formative dimension that's not just purely leisurely? Yeah, I, that just uh, reminds me of a question that I was asked in an online presentation in June. Uh, and I think the person started asking the same sort of question that spiritual disciplines seem more like work, whereas the the quotations uh, may reflect more of a positive view. Uh, well, that's why I thought, just, I was thinking of the question, and then you give that as in the front, you know, so mm-hmm. it's interesting, because it's leisurely, but obviously it involves discipline. Yeah. Right? Well, I mean, worship is, I mean, worship is distinct from leisure and it's distinct from work. And that worship, uh, you know, that, 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 uh, uh, Peeper talks about that as being the foundation, the wellspring for leisure. And I would, I would say that, you know, that's an attitude, but you, you develop that attitude through uh, spiritual exercises, spiritual disciplines, and so on. So there's an element, I'm, um, yeah, there's a quote, a great, uh, graceful 
discipline and discipline and grace. They go together, you know. There's, there's some work involved, but it's not, it's not just our work. It's a gift, and it's a paradox, but they go together, right? Yes. Any comments regarding the role of, they call it a public theology. So stores are not open seven days a week. Uh, schools, in the U.S. anyway, kids are involved in sports programs Monday, Saturday, and every evening. Uh, you know, capitalism has made every minute of time and every space that we see or experience filled with some demand upon us to do something. Uh, is there any role for policy to, you know, create an atmosphere within which we can better, you know, rest, work, worship, play, uh, to comparison? I think so. Uh, I mean, I don't know what we can do right now. Back in, I'm from Ottawa, and uh, I've been involved in an organization called uh, Citizen Public Justice, so it's a Christian public justice organization in Canada. And back in the 1990s, we used to have laws in Ontario where stores weren't open except for corner stores. And so Citizen Public Justice, I remember coming down here to Toronto and being part of the Ontario Council, that we you know, were arguing against that. And at that point in time, we realized that, you know, just the Christians argue for that, they probably would not succeed. So we worked together with other faith communities and argued for a common pause day. Like, okay, it may not be Sunday, but let's have at least one day a week. Uh, of course, I wasn't successful and we had Sunday shopping. Subsequently, I moved to Nova Scotia, where they still had no shopping on Sundays. You could really tell the difference. But then subsequently, they have it. Uh, in uh, Sunday shopping in Nova Scotia now. So I don't, you know, I don't know what we can do corporately to change that. Uh, being personally, we can resist. So, I mean, I said that I'm a runner, so I choose my races as much as possible on Saturdays, another day of the week. Uh, I, I, you know, I was brought up in a very strict family that didn't do anything on, on Sundays other than eat and go to church and rest. And, you know, I'm not as good as my parents, but I still try to do that. So, you know, I think we can encourage one another to take that day of rest. Um, going back to what someone said before, I can't remember. Uh, Eugene Peterson used to take Mondays off when he was a pastor and he went to Regent College. And then he could take Sundays off and he, he said that there was a big difference of celebrating the Sabbath on Sunday versus uh, Monday because there was a communal dimension to it. And, and when I, I teach some courses at the University for Christian Students, extra courses, and they say, well, the Sabbath, that's an individual thing, but there's a, there's a communal dimension to it as well. So we may not be able to change society, but at least within the Christian community, I think we should be encouraging that, that communal dimension to Sabbath. I'm not sure, what, again, whether that answers your question. It's not a question that can be answered anymore, just like a query mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.